Amen, amen. Hello, everyone, and again, thank you all for tuning in tonight to the Issachar Hour with me, Timothy Fleming Jr. Again, thank you all for watching tonight. Uh, again, we have an exciting word that we're going to jump into in tonight's Bible study lesson. Uh, so again, I want to encourage you all to, for those that are watching, go ahead and hit the share button so that other people can also tune in and be a part of tonight's uh, Bible study. So go ahead and hit that share button so we can go ahead and get more people also into the room. And we're going to go ahead and get started at this time. going to start first with a word of prayer and we're going to dive right in. Father, we thank you for your grace, mercy, and for your love. We bless you tonight and thank you for the opportunity to get into your word one more time. We plead the blood of Jesus over this Bible study. We declare that no distractions and no hindrances and no interferences uh, shall take place. We thank you right now, Lord, for opening our spiritual ears and our spiritual eyes and giving us hearts of understanding. And we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. And we cover this Bible study under the blood of Jesus. And thank you, Lord, that your truth shall set us free. We love you. We praise you. And we adore you, King Jesus. It's in your name that we pray in Jesus name. Amen. And again, thank you, everyone, for tuning in on tonight as we go ahead and, and jump right into uh, tonight's word. So let's go ahead and just uh, dive right in. Uh, we've been talking a lot about, again, just going through the book of Revelation, uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, uh, covering this mysterious book uh, and breaking it down so that we can get a full understanding of the imagery, the symbolisms, the messaging, everything that's coming out of this particular book. Uh, so we're going to continue to, to trek forward tonight and, and keep going with uh, picking up with where we left off on last week. Uh, and on last week, again, we were talking about the fifth trumpet. So we're going to finish up with the fifth trumpet and move right into uh, the sixth trumpet of Revelation. Uh, so I'm going to uh, go back to our key scriptures and and put those verses back up on the screen uh, at this time. So let's go ahead and, and share this to my page here. Uh, Revelation again, chapter, and we're looking at chapter uh, eight. Well, let me blow this up a little bit here. I'm sorry, chapter nine, chapter nine, Revelation chapter nine. Uh, and, and again, I'll just read through uh, the first couple of verses, and then we'll, like I said, just finish that one up, and then we'll go right into the sixth chapter. Uh, so again, we were looking last week at, at the uh, fifth, the fifth trumpet, the fifth trumpet, uh, uh, which John the Revelator saw the angel blow. Uh, so when the eagle was flying through the sky in, in chapter 8, the, the final verse, and the eagle said, uh, Woe unto the inhabitants that are still on the earth uh, for the next three, uh, you know, uh, things that are getting ready to come upon the earth are going to be horrendous. You know, I, uh, basically what the, those eagles were saying is I I. I feel sorry for those that are, that are, that after all of the carnage and everything that has already happened, I feel sorry for the ones that are still there, the ones that are left behind because it, they, they uh, it's going to get a whole lot worse uh, for for them. And that's where we picked up in the ninth chapter. So in chapter nine, John the Revelator, he starts out here in the first verse. Uh, he says, I saw the fifth angel blow his trumpet. And again, this is the New Living Translation. And I saw a star that fell, uh, that, that had fallen to earth from the sky. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Uh, and we talked a lot about that on last week, about that bottomless pit and how hell has different departments. There are different levels to hell. So it's not just one flat surface. No, there are different levels. There are different angels that are bound in different levels or areas of hell, one being Tartarus, but then the bottomless pit. 
uh, is beneath that that uh, department, if you will. Uh, it's all the way at the very bottom, this bottomless pit. And so it said when it opened up, smoke poured out uh, as though from a huge furnace and the sunlight and the air turned dark from the smoke and locusts uh, came from the smoke and descended upon the earth and they were given the power to sting like scorpions. Uh, God warned these locusts or these are actually demons. Uh, these are actually demonic spirits. And oftentimes you'll find that almost, almost interchangeable at times in scripture when it talks about locusts and things. Uh, it is talking about in a physical sense, the physical uh, insects, and then in a spiritual sense, demonic spirits. Uh, and oftentimes we like to, for example, uh, in the book of Matthew, uh, where Matthew talks about in the third chapter, bring your tithe into the storehouse of the Lord, uh, that there may be, may be meat in his house and he will rebuke the devourer for your name's sake. Well, we know in the physical, literal sense, he was talking about the locust, the palmer worm, canker worm, all of the insects that normally eat up one's uh, harvest, physical harvest. But in a spiritual sense, those things also represent demons, demonic spirits that tend to eat up our harvest spiritually or our harvest as it pertains to uh, in life, you know, uh, finances, our our generational blessings that they're demons on assignment that whose assignment is to destroy family uh, lineages, bloodline blessings. They are that that's their only assignment is to make sure uh, that blessings that were supposed to flow from one generation to the next, they don't flow. They get eaten up. They get destroyed and not to take time and kind of deal with this, but I, I was thinking about this just a little earlier today about how the, how the devil, uh, set, how he really releases different spirits to destroy generational wealth and generational blessings. Um, and some there are some people that have had, uh, for example, I, I remember I, I had a family reunion a couple of years back and I was listening uh, to to a lot of uh, there was one. Uh, every family has one that just kind of knows the family history. And this person was just explaining. And, and I didn't know that, you know, in our family, we actually have a park uh, somewhere in middle Georgia, an actual park named after us. I think that's our family's property or what have you. But come to find out that I think it was a great, great uh, uh, grandfather or so uh, who owned a, a ton of land uh, out in middle Georgia. In fact, I think it's where the Warner Robins well, Air Force Base or so sit. But he had a ton of land that he owned uh, that was taken from him after the Great Depression. Um, and so there, there was, you know, we, we hear about this that there was some inheritance that was supposed to pass down wealth that was supposed to pass down. But Satan, as he would have it, would do everything in his power to try to block and destroy uh, the passing of generational wealth and, and inheritance that God uh, deems for us to have. And if there are no prayer warriors in the family, if there are no people in the, in the household that understands divine legal rights and know how to pray and pray against what the enemy is doing and, and so on and so forth, then the enemy will succeed in his plans. And the reason why that's so important to him is because, you know, uh, without the wealth and things that God is trying to get to you, it'll be very difficult, if not nearly impossible, for you to actually live out your purpose. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, money answereth all things. Translated, it provides the means for you to do the things that God is actually calling you to do. Amen. So the devil want to put a stop to that. And he knows that the way to do so is to block financial blessings. Amen. So like I say, I'm not going into that teaching, but 
oftentimes when you when you read in scripture about the devourer and locusts and things, it does in the spiritual sense refer to demons. So let's get back to this. In this passage, it is literally referring to demons, not to some animal or creature, but to actual demonic spirit. So let's get back to this one here. Uh, so what John said, what he saw, these uh, spirits, they uh, had uh, scorp they were able to sting like scorpions. Uh, verse six, in those days, people will seek death and not find it. We talked about that last week as well, how God has authority over death. Death is not just a process, but a spirit, i.e. the spirit of death. And yet God knows how to preserve the body so that even the body cannot die. And God has that, that power and that ability. So God removes from man during this brief period the ability to die as uh, so that they could uh, uh, so withstand the torments of these particular demons. Uh, verse number seven, again, uh, John gave a description of how these demons look, hair like women, uh, teeth like lions, faces like humans. Um, they were all prepared and like battle armor. Uh, look like horses that were prepared for battle, gold crowns on their heads. Uh, they had armor. They had wings uh, that sound like chariots rushing into battle. As they flap their wings and again, tails uh, uh, like scorpions. And for, like I say, a brief period for five months, uh, they were given the power to torment men on the earth. And we really hit this part hard. Verse 11, they had a king over them, the king of the demons from the bottomless pit. His name is Abaddon, or in the Greek, Apollyon, i.e. Apollos, the destroyer. And one of the things that we brought out very strongly on last week is the identity of this god, Apollos. The identity of the god, Apollos, and how Apollos in Greek culture and mythology, he became the god of divination, the Python spirit. And that's why when we read in the book of Acts, the 16th chapter, the girl who was possessed of the spirit of divination so that she was operating as a psychic, psychic phenomena, all of that stuff, that's, that, that stuff was from a demonic spirit. Uh, people who are operating as psychics and operating in divination, fortune telling and all of that stuff, astrology. These are all the workings of the spirit of divination, which is the God Apollos. Because right there in Acts 16, when Paul turned around and he rebuked the demon out of the girl, the Bible say he cast that spirit out, the spirit of divination. That word divination in the Greek is python. So when you go to the original Greek language, it doesn't say divination, it says python. And the association is that the python spirit in Greek culture was known as the god Apollos. Uh, Apollos became the, the python spirit after he killed this serpent that was guarding the entrance to a hail or Hades, the shaft that, that was guarding the entrance there. And he inherited the powers of that serpent to be able to see into the future and all of these things. So again, I warn and caution people because even again, and I throw this back up, that when a lot of people get so wrapped up into their culture, oh, you know, we as black people, we got to go back to our roots. We got to go back to our roots and get back with our ancient ancestors and our ancestral uh, religions. And, and, and you'll notice that even in those religions, uh, when they talk about the ether and all of these different things, it, they use the same symbolism, imagery, and everything that you find in Hinduism and in all of these other things. They talk about different colors and chakras. They talk about, and, and here's the biggest part. They talk about serpents and serpents giving a person an ability to see into the future or see into other dimensions. And that's why all of the pharaohs of ancient Egypt in their headrest, they had a serpent right there in the center 
because this is one of those things from ancient traditions that a serpent was always uh, associated with the ability to see into the future. It, uh, it was always a power attributed to a serpent. And the same thing in Hinduism, the Kundalini spirit, which in yoga is a serpent spirit that uh, uh, enters into your body when you're performing yoga and transcendental meditation. And it begins to work its way up through your body, through up, up your spine, moving through the chakras and all of that stuff. And it's supposed to lead you into this this almost euphoric experience where you experience psychic phenomena, where you can see into other, all of that stuff literally is nothing but Satan's deception. The devil is a serpent. That's what Paul said. Uh, Satan, that old serpent. Amen. And all he's doing is trying to trick man into relying on him for supernatural provision and guidance. That's all it's about. And a lot of people are biting the bait and pretty much making deals with the devil, you know, that if that if he would just uh, uh, bless them and, and reveal to them this, that and the other, then, you know, but but, but you got to be careful about that. Because, again, when you start uh, receiving from the enemy, his hand becomes the hand that feeds you. And the reason why in Scripture uh, it's so funny because in Malachi chapter three, and I know I talked about this before, but in Malachi chapter three, God emphasized that when you tithe, I will send the rain upon the land and I will rebuke the devourer, the, all of the insects that come to eat up the harvest. I will do this. I am the God that makes it rain. It's funny that God said it that way. And he said, I will pour out so much until you don't even have enough room to, to contain the harvest and everything that's going to come as a result of the rain that I see upon your crops. And, you know, uh, uh, this is important, especially for people who lived off of agriculture, who we all live off of agriculture. I don't care if you're a city boy or not. Uh, you go to the grocery store, but the food in the grocery store come from the farms. And whenever a drought hits, that means the grocery store shelves are empty. So for the people at this time, most of whom were all farmers and fishermen, it was very important that they got rain during regular rain seasons, uh, during cycles, so that their crops could grow. Because if a drought came through, everybody starved. There was no food to be found anywhere. People in Old Testament resorted to cannibalism as a result of droughts. So God said, I'm the God that sends the rain. But it's so funny that God said that because the idol God, the number one idol that was worshipped in the land of Canaan was a God known as Baal. And Baal, when you go and search up Baal, who this God was, he was known as the God of rain, the God that sent the rain uh, so that people's crops could grow. And so Israel would often find themselves in a in a battle. Do we turn to God or do we turn to Baal? You know, we maybe we can turn to God for protection and turn to Baal uh, for agriculture and for, you know, for rain for our crops. And God said, no, I am the God that makes the rain. So turn to me, honor me, and I will send the rain. And one of the things that happened in ancient Israel is because they turned to Baal, God allowed droughts to hit the land. And it's all, all God was saying to the nation of Israel and to us today. He's saying, I, want, I am your provider. I am your provider. Look to me for everything. Never look to, uh, to, to the world system. I mean, God uses people, but people are not God. So you appreciate people for being used by God, but you don't look to people as your source. You don't begin to worship people and, and devote yourself to them. No, God says, I am the provider. Turn to me because I am the God of rain. And that's not just rain in the physical sense. I remember a couple of years ago uh, here in Georgia, uh, it was when uh, Governor Sonny Perdue, 
He was governor uh, here of Georgia. And I think everybody that, that lives here, we remember that. Uh, there was a drought that hit this, this state. Uh, we were under a severe drought. And I mean, it was so bad to the governor had to come over to television and radio and tell people you are not allowed to water your lawns. You are not allowed to wash your cars. We have to preserve water because Georgia is running out of water. We don't have enough water in our preserves. I mean, we are running dry and we will get into a place of desperation. Yes, we were actually experiencing a drought just a few short years ago. And I'll never forget when the governor, Governor Sonny Perdue, uh, along with his administration, they stood right there on the steps of the governor's mansion, held hands, and they began to pray and cry out to God, Lord, Lord, we turn to you right now. Lord, please send rain. Lord, we repent. And they began to pray. I'm talking about not no political prayer in the name of him whom we all know. No, they were praying. In the name of Jesus, God send the rain. And the crazy thing is the very next day, it started raining and it kept raining and it kept raining. Then we got to the point where it was like, all right, God, can you stop sending the rain? <laughs> but it's, it's amazing because that was a testament to God and his power and how these miracles that we saw in the Old Testament, they still work today. Amen. They still work today. So God said, I am the God that makes the rain. I am the God that provides. I'm the one that, like Paul said, I may plant, another may water, but only God gives the increase. God say, I'm the God of increase. So learn how to put all of your trust and your confidence in me. Now, that is a big struggle for many people who profess to be followers of Christ. And one of the ways that God was able to indicate who truly trusted him, here's the key right here, was by those who honored him in the tithe, who honored them with their substance. That's why the book of Numbers declares that one of the reasons God instituted the tithe is so that we would learn to fear God. It's not because God needs your money. No, so that we can learn to fear him. And by fear, it doesn't mean to be afraid of, but it means to reverence him and to acknowledge him as our source and our sole provider. So how, did God, how does God know that you are truly an adherent to his word and that you trust him and that you are truly walking in covenant with him, looking to him as your only source by what you do with your substance, i.e. your money? Glory to God. So it was the test that God gave the ancient Israelites when he said, try me and see. But it's also the same test that God gives us, which is why the Apostle Paul talks so much about money, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Amen. And also in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, as he talked about the seed offering. Glory to God. That who is your source? Who is your actual source? So it's easy for me to get up and say, oh, no, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. But then all of my finances go here and go there and go there and go there. And when it comes to giving to God or to the things of God, all of a sudden I'm sitting back and I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't know. And God is like, well, that's that's the indication to know whether or not you are walking in covenant and that you are trusting me uh, as your source, not by what you say. And it's funny because the Apostle Paul actually says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, where he was speaking to the church of Corinth. And he said, I'm giving you the opportunity to prove the sincerity of your love. And by that, he was saying, I hear you talking about how much you love God, but now prove it. And in that context, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, he was asking the church of Corinth to begin to sow financially because he, he was trying to help the Christians in Jerusalem who were under intense persecution. So he was appealing to the other churches that he had established, and the church of Corinth was one of the wealthiest churches and the Apostle Paul in the eighth chapter said, I'm giving you the chance to prove the sincerity of your love. So I know this is not one of those points that make a lot of people feel good, 
but it's one of those things that must be emphasized because again, God says, I am your provider, but the only way to prove I'm your provider is you have to honor me with your substance. And I know some people are like, well, I don't, I don't like that. Well, <laughs> it just shows that, you know, you can, you may claim that Christ is your master, but really mammon is your master. If you're not willing to honor God, not just with lip service, but honor God in the area of your giving. Amen. Where man's treasury is, there shall his heart be also. So we have to honor God when it comes to our tithe. And I know some people, they don't like to teach that. They don't like to talk about that. Amen. Uh, but we still have to honor God. Uh, Jesus said, I didn't come and do away with, with God's system. Tithing existed before the, the Levitical laws were even in place because Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. It was a well-known principle. But where did the principles of tithing and offerings even come from? Well, you go all the way back to the book of Genesis after Adam and Eve sinned. Their sons, the next verse tells us their sons were giving offerings to the Lord. Well, who taught them how to give an offering? Wow. So all the way going back to before Noah, before the flood, before uh, before Methuselah and all of these people, going all the way back to Adam and Eve, you have the principle of giving, a systematic way of giving, not just giving you know, uh, randomly, no, a systematic way. In other words, a whole protocol that surrounded giving, which is why God rejected Cain's offering and had respect for Abel's offering because Cain's was done wrongly. Abel's was given by faith, meaning in the correct protocol that God ordained. So this has always been a part of God's system that we honor God with our substance as a way of proving that we trust him and that he is our provider. And also what that does is it unlocks certain spiritual uh, blessings and doors or enables God to begin to release certain blessings in our lives that are held up from us as a result of us not honoring, honoring him with our substance. Amen. So like I say, that's a whole nother Bible study, but I wanted to bring that out because again, the Israelites, you know, they turned to Baal as opposed to God and they suffered a drought because of it, because they trusted the wrong God, the, the imposter who claimed to be the owner of rain, when the real one that makes it rain was standing right in front of them. Amen. So I want you to see this again. We talked about this and we talked about these this this God Apollos uh, very strongly on last week. And one of the connections that we made, not just with the ancient Greek culture of understanding who Apollos uh, was uh, or is, but also understanding how people in this very day and time uh, continue to worship uh, the, the, the God Apollos. And I'm going to I'm going I'm going to put this up on the screen because again, I know that we we talked about this last week, but it, this this will be a a little bit of a, a recap for some people, amen. But you know, with a lot of the fraternities and sororities and secret societies, all of these things, these clandestine groups, uh, hidden secretive groups and organizations, all of this stuff. Uh, and and I and and I want to I want to emphasize here because uh, what we would call the granddaddy of them all is the Freemasons, uh, the Freemasons, uh, which is like the the top of the list there. Uh, and the Freemasons, I mean, they what is the secret name of God? Job Ulon, you know, J A B U L O N, whatever. And it's supposed to be a combination of of, of Baal and Jehovah, and, and and they what they do is they would take all of God and all of these other deities and all of these other entities, and they would combine them together, almost like they are creating a new pantheon. Uh, and just try to put them all in one boat together. And what the Bible teaches is that is complete and pure idolatry. And idolatry is one of those sins that will send you straight to hell. 
And I know somebody say, well, that sounds funny. One of those sins. Well, go and read first John chapter five. There is a sin that is not unto death. In other words, you don't go to hell because you ate pork. You know, I know some people, they get all, you know, whenever somebody is lying and they don't know the Bible, you'll, you'll tell because they'll say dumb stuff like the Bible say eating pork is an abomination. And, and no, the Bible didn't say that. It just told you, you know, from a Levitical, especially a ceremonial standpoint that, look, do not eat unclean things. But from a practical standpoint, don't eat it because it's bad for your body. So there were certain animals that God designated in the book of Genesis to Noah when he told Noah, load all of the animals onto the ark in groups of two by two. But for the clean animals, load them into the ark in groups of seven. Why? Because while you're on that ark, 40 days and 40 nights, the clean animals are for human consumption. So <laughs> this is even before Levitical law. There are some things God say you ain't supposed to eat. And but if you decide to eat it, you're not going to go to hell. You may have hell on earth <laughs> with some health issues, but it doesn't affect your soul. But there are some things that you will do that will send you straight to hell. And idolatry, worshiping an idol God is one of those things. And I try to caution people very firmly that you need to be careful about aligning yourself and attaching yourself to any kind of organization or group that esteems an idol. I don't care what it is. If it esteems an idol, get away from it, get out of it. Or do what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, be ye separate, saith the Lord. What fellowship does Christ have with Belial, light with darkness? Uh, you know, what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? Take your hands off of the unclean thing and I will receive you unto myself again and be a father unto you. So when a person engages in idolatry, they are separating themselves from God and like the Israelites, putting themselves under the authority of a demonic spirit because that's what the idol gods were, demons. They were demonic spirits. And I tell people all the time, you know, you need to come out of all of that stuff, Freemasonry and all of that stuff. Look, there are no secret rituals in the Bible. There, there are no hidden rituals. You know, I, I want to stop and say something about this because I, I, I really didn't want to dive into it a lot, but I do need to say something because when you look at uh, Freemasonry, blood of Jesus, hallelujah. When, when you look at Freemasonry, a lot of the things, the damage uh, that is that has come uh, out of that organization. Uh, against believers, uh, some of the, the some of the worst teachings and 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 worst beliefs. Uh, for example, and, and and it's fitting to bring this up because this is Black History Month. <clears throat> uh, Freemasonry. This was the organization, and I talked about this before. Uh, <laughs> glory to God. How uh, Freemasonry was the. Uh, uh, this 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 uh, organization, it was really introduced or brought here to America by a guy named Albert Pike. And I was trying to see if I still had a picture of him in my slides. I, I think I had taken all of his, uh, his removed his uh, from my, my, my thing here. But a guy named Albert Pike and Albert Pike, uh, he wrote in his book, Morals and Dogma. And the thing about it is you anybody can get their hands on the book. Actually, I have it right here. <laughs> I got it right here. Albert Pike. Now, this is actually a direct quote from Albert Pike's book, Morals and Dogma. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name given to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning. Is it he who bears the light and with its splendors and tolerable blinds, feeble sensual or selfish souls doubt it not in other words albert pike this guy he say he's saying throughout his book morals and dogma that lucifer is god lucifer is god lucifer is god that's what albert pike the guy who introduced freemasonry the guy who is responsible for freemasonry here in our nation that's what this guy was teaching that's what this guy believed and where did he get it from? Because this was the regular belief system. 
This was the regular belief system of, of all of the individuals that were a part of that secret society. Uh, so that's one of the things that he taught. And it's funny because everybody that came after him that started some religious movement. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me bring this up because one of the things that Albert Pike, he was also known for, as I mentioned on last week, he was also one of the founding members of the Ku Klux Klan, <laughs> which is why the Klan, they, they resemble the Freemasons so much in their uh, rituals and all of that stuff. They have to go through all of these rituals that they do to burn another cross. They have all of these different names and titles, Grand, Cyc Grand Cyclops, Grand Dragon, and all of this stuff. All of these rituals, this was literally uh, copy and paste taken straight from many of the rituals and things that were found in Freemasonry. Blacks were not allowed to be be members of Freemasonry, and and and, the, and and understandably so because one of the doctrines that came out of Freemasonry is a doctrine known as serpent seed theology, and serpent seed theology literally says that Eve had sexual relations with the serpent in the garden. That the, the, the serpent, i.e. the devil, he didn't just show up and say, hey, you know, sister girl, look here, that fruit on the tree, go ahead and eat that. God, he just insecure. He know if you eat it, you're going to be like him. He didn't just deceive Eve. Number one, she was already like God. <laughs> she had a body that could not die. She could see into other dimensions, both she and Adam. I mean, they, they were already like God. So the devil came and promised her something she already had. And that's the sad thing. But uh, not only did he, according to serpent seed theology, not only did the devil come and, and deceive her, but the two of them got intimate together. And as a result of that union, Eve and the serpent gave birth to Cain. And Cain is, according to Freemasonry, the father of all black <laughs> people, all African and black people or what have you. So according to their theology, the black race is a direct descendant of Lucifer. So that is serpent seed theology. And the, the sad thing about it is, again, there, there were so many pastors, especially in the 1920s and 30s, uh, who were, who, because they did not know the word of God. Now, I know this may sound like, you know, like a oxymoron, a pastor that, that doesn't know the word. That's this job to preach the word. But no, there were plenty of preachers, and just like they are today, who actually don't read the word of God. They may study the preacher sermon. They may study philosophy and grab a little bit here and there, and they get into all of this other stuff. Some come with an Afrocentric philosophical, uh, a secular humanist concoction that they serve up every Sunday morning, but none of it is gospel. They just cherry pick scriptures here and there to try to eisegete the text so that it conforms to their own ideology and endorses their own agenda. But nowhere in the picture are they really aligned with the agenda of God. They don't know the word of God. They don't understand the scripture. Amen. And, and it's a dangerous thing when you have people in the pulpit that don't know the word of God. They know oratorical skills. They know how to excite the crowd. They know how to elevate their, their voice. They understand pitch and tone, and they understand all of that stuff. They know all of the cliches that can move people. They know how to emotionalize, but they don't understand the word of God. And that's a frightening reality to be sitting under that, in that kind of environment and being spoon-fed lies, and you're saying, amen, amen, and and they and literally they are taking you straight to hell with them. That is a frightening thing. Amen. And that's exactly what was happening in, in the 30s, 20s and 30s when all of this stuff was going on and this serpent seed and all, all of these people, these pastors and leaders were starting to join the Freemasons and they started preaching all of this stuff and they started spreading all of this stuff among their members and their congregations and <laughs> and 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 out out from Freemasonry came other uh, movements. 
Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon cult. Uh, uh, Charles Russell, the founder of the Jehovah's Witness cult. And why do you think both of those movements, Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness, why is it that they really, uh, to be honest with you, esteem Lucifer so much, especially in Mormonism, where Lucifer is regarded as Jesus's biological brother? And why do you think that their doctrine and theology is so off center and all over the place? It's because when you are connected to something that is of the demonic realm, there's always going to be uh, there's always going to be a a uh, I, I don't want to use the word mixture. The, I'm trying to think of the the correct word. There's always going to be a corrupting of the truth. You're going to find yourself diluted with a whole bunch of lies. Uh, lies that are being mixed in uh, with portions of scripture, and and it's gonna just be a a big <laughs> a, a big abomination, a whole big mess, and that's what you see when you look at Mormonism, because Mormonism started teaching the same stuff. They started claiming that the mark that God placed on Cain. After Cain murdered Abel and God placed a mark on Cain uh, to identify him, to distinguish him, Mormons started teaching that the mark that God placed on Cain was that God marked him with black skin. In other words, he became a black man and that became the teaching of Mormonism. So you were not allowed to be a Mormon. If you were black, you couldn't be a Mormon. Uh, only more in recent years did they start opening up the temple and everything else uh, to allow blacks to come into that organization. But all of this started out of Luciferianism. The same with Jehovah's Witness. That's the reason why Charles uh, uh, Russell, he he was basically, uh, 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 he was basically, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, rejected by every uh, every God fearing uh, uh, a believer, a uh, pastor, leader in the church that knew the word of God. That, oh no, they was like, no, that's a heretic. Why? Because his teachings and doctrines. Anytime you align yourself with with something that is of the demonic realm, Satan will always slip his poison into your into your message into your ministry into into your church he will always slip it in and that's the dangerous thing because whenever pastors and leaders are a part of these organizations one of the things they fail to do because they feel like they can't do it will be a contradiction that i'm a part of this and i'm speaking out against it one of the things they cannot do is they cannot condemn idolatry they won't preach on it. They won't talk about it. They'll bring messages about, oh, yeah, sister girl, I'm telling you, you know, every guy, if he don't work, you need to kick him to the curb. And all the women are going, yeah, and they'll just start dancing and shouting. And that ain't no gospel. That That's called secular humanism. That's just called emotionalizing a person. Steve Harvey can stand up and say that. I mean, Cat Williams can stand up and say that. Anybody can say that. <laughs> that ain't no gospel. But when you get into the word of God, you get into the very first two commandments. The first two commandments. Thou shall have no other God beside me. Commandment number one. Commandment number two. Thou shall make no graven image. Of anything in the sky, in the in the earth, on the land, or even in the sea below, no graven image. Don't make any statues. Don't have no little bitty statues, or, or don't don't even walk around carrying some statue of Mary or or the baby Jesus, or have some car. No, don't put your trust and confidence in any image because God is a spirit. Those that that worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. And he says, do not make any graven image, for I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. God didn't say, I'm going to punish your children because of your sin. But he said, if your children hate me the same way you do, they'll get the same results that you got. So parents train their children to walk in, in idolatry and iniquity. And as a result thereof, 
curses pass right on to their children. And, and glory to God. And so when a person is caught up into that, you'll notice that they are, not, they are never preaching the gospel. They are no, never going line by line, uh, actually exegeting the text and talking authoritatively from, from the scripture. Uh, bringing up, listen, bringing up the issue of sin. They don't, they, they don't even talk about that. It's like, oh no, we, the, the, you know, and then they use excuses. So, see, we, we believe in love. We don't believe in condemning, condemning, condemning. Well, last I read my, in my Bible, it tells us in the book of Hebrews, looking in 11, 12 chapters that God chastises those that he loves. That means of God, loves you, he's going to put that divine belt on your backside because he doesn't want you to perish. And he knows that correction is the one thing that proves his love towards you. In fact, my Bible tells me in the book of Proverbs that the parent that does not chastise or correct their child hates their child. So those parents that are out there, oh, I don't chastise my child. According to scripture, you hate your kids. Because the only way that they're going to survive and make it in culture, in our society today, be able to coexist with other people is you have to train them in, in manners, teach them how to be respectful. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, sir. No, ma'am. Train them and teach them how to be honorable and respectful. And that's the reason why the fifth commandment out of the Ten Commandments, that one says, honor your mother and your father that your days may be long upon the earth. It is This is the one commandment with promise. In other words, violate that commandment, you, your life going to get cut short. The principle of honor is this, that you learn how to respect authority. You don't worship authority. No, no man is God, but respect. You learn how to live by a code of honor and respect. And that's the one thing that's missing. That's what's missing. Uh, in a lot of a lot of the schools, the teach what is what are the teachers complaining about? Kids ain't got no respect. I'm sitting here telling them to sit down, be quiet, and trying to teach the kids looking at me, telling me, you sit down, or you shut up. I'm on my phone. You know, it's like you ain't got no respect. You know, uh, nowadays people have no respect for law enforcement. And I know that I know I was shady history past. I've been pulled over a number of times for driving while black. <laughs> Glory to God. Hey, man. <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong there. I even had a cop put his gun in my face. <laughs> you know, a white officer put his gun in my face. And, and I made sure uh, that I pulled over in, in a crowded parking lot where everybody could see, with cameras everywhere, because uh, he put his lights, and I knew he was following me, and he's going to get out, got his gun in my face, and then going to check my ID and say, oh, I'm sorry, it was mistaken identity. But I'm like, yeah, I'm going to make sure that I'm in a place where everybody can see in case. So, so I, I get that. But look, according to Romans chapter 13, God has created law and order to curtail evil. And I tell people this, look, if there if there are if there's racism inside of law enforcement and so on so on and so forth then why don't you actually get involved with it amen so that you can actually affect change you know you're not going to affect change by sitting back just complaining no you need to get involved you need to you need to be the one out there running for office you need to be the one <laughs> I'm sorry glory to God I try to get on the but a little soapbox here but but you begin to change things from the inside if you see that there's corruption you get in there and change things just don't become the very thing that you hate but but you know without a sense of honor Without any kind of honor, uh, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, uh, the author says to uh, to honor and make it easy on the pastors and leaders, those who God has appointed uh, to stand guard over your souls. Honor, honoring the man of God, honoring the woman of God. You know, I've, I've, I've shared this several times with people. I like, look, uh, 
uh, when it comes to my position and role in ministry, I tell people you can refer to me as Reverend Junior, Reverend Fleming Junior, whatever. But then there are some people that, oh, hey, what's up? You know, T, what's up? And I'm like, oh, look, when, when it comes to ministry context, then understand that I'm operating in a role. I'm operating in my position. Now, look, we hanging out at Buffalo Wild Wings and we catching the game or we looking at the fight. Hey, what's up, Tim? <laughs> but when it comes to this right here, there's a um, there's a code of honor. There's a code of honor when it comes to even in the marriage, even in the marriage, uh, the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Notice how God has this system of honor that there's there's respect, there's honor. And there are some people that because they have no sense of honor, God will not elevate them because the principle is from first Peter chapter five, submit yourselves to the elders and God will exalt you in due season. But notice who God said submit to. He didn't say submit yourself to the Holy Ghost. No, he said submit yourself to the elders. Translated, he was telling us to follow a chain of command so that we could have a sense of honor. Now, if there's an elder or leader in the church that is teaching something that ain't biblical, don't receive it. Don't accept it. Don't listen to it. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, mark them that spread or preach or teach a false gospel. Mark them. <laughs> that will be the equivalent of on Facebook, you get up and say, this is a heretic and let everybody know. <laughs> so <laughs> Paul was pretty, pretty hardcore there, to, to be honest with you. I'm much nicer than Paul was. <laughs> he was a he was a beast. But um, but, uh, you know, when it comes to someone tell, uh, in, in leadership telling you to do something sinful or something that, you know, uh, goes against the will of God for your life. No. In fact, the leaders were not supposed to lord over God's people. First Peter chapter five. That means exert dominance and control as if they are controlling your life. You better be here for a choir rehearsal or else or else your left pinky toe going to fall off and you're going to lose your job. No, that's called witchcraft. Witchcraft. Leader don't have a right to sit there threatening you if you don't fall in line. And no, Peter said you don't be a, a lord over God's people, but be an example. In other words, you lead by example. And if you ask someone to do something and they cannot do it, you respect their wishes that they cannot do it and find someone else that can. That's how God deals with us anyway. God doesn't force his will on us. He'll ask us, do you want to be used by me? Do you want to do this? Do you want to? And you can say yes or no to God. Either way, God still loves you and he doesn't threaten you. Either you be a pastor or else I'm going to make sure. No, God will be like, well, I'll just take this mantle and give it to somebody else that says yes. And I'll just use you in a different way. That's how God deals with us. He doesn't deal with us the way some, some leaders try to do. Um, glory to God. <laughs> I thought I was going to get to the next uh, next trumpet, but I, I'm, I'm still talking about this one. But, but again, <laughs> you know, when we look at uh, just, just the origin of so many demonic doctrines, you know, and none of it is in the Bible, by the way. There ain't no such thing as serpent seed theology in the text. Nowhere, nowhere. That's as dumb. That 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 theology is just as dumb and as stupid as the belief that Adam had a first wife named Lilith before he met Eve. Adam was married to Lilith, and then he and Lilith got kept getting into arguments because Lilith didn't want to listen, didn't want to submit and obey. So Adam said, I'm divorcing you, girl, and kicked her out. <laughs> and then God said, All right, let me give you a new wife. He, that is the dumbest thing I ever heard. And yet that is something that certain people claim as a theological point, which has no bearing whatsoever. You got to be careful. Don't mix mythology and uns unsubstantiated claims with the Bible. 
That's what Paul warned Timothy when he said, be careful about getting into all of these arguments over endless genealogies. And he was referring to the gods because all of the ancient gods, they generally had parents and aunties and uncles and siblings. You know, I talked about this one and I, you know, God forgive it, you know, but, but I, I, I'm not picking on any one belief or whatever, but Going back to Islam, for example, uh, Muhammad in the Quran, you know, he couldn't write. He was illiterate. He didn't know how to read or write. So he just dictated. And that's, you know, he would just sit down and speak and someone would be writing, transcribing what he said. And that's how the Quran came about. Uh, but Muhammad had been taught the Bible by one of his relevant relatives, Waraka bin Nawfal, I think that was his name, who was a Christian living in the pre-Islamic Middle East era at that time. And Muhammad, but in one of his recitations, Muhammad uh, instructed his followers, you need to pray to the daughters of Allah, Al-Manat, -Al 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 -Manat, and I forgot, <laughs> the, the, excuse me if I'm mastering the name, but three daughters of Allah. And then he turned around and he told his transcriber, I want you to delete that verse. And then he plugged this shura into the Quran. He says, every now and then, Satan will possess the messenger of Allah and begin to recite through him. Translate it. Oh, don't write that down in the Quran. That wasn't me speaking. That was Satan himself speaking through me. So edit that verse out. Now, that's scary by itself. A leader of a religious movement openly telling you that Satan every now and then speaks through me. <laughs> and that's in conjunction with him telling you that his God, Allah, is the best deceiver. Translate it. He actively engages in deception. But when you look at the etymology of Allah, Allah was the patron deity of Medina, which was Muhammad's hometown. But he had been driven out of his hometown of Medina because everybody thought he was demon possessed. It was only his wife, Khadija, that began to convince him, no, baby, you're not demon possessed. You are called of God. And when Muhammad, Muhammad went to war with the king of Mecca, he conquered Mecca, destroyed, destroyed the king of Mecca, and destroyed the original Kaaba, which is the black stone that you see there, the centerpiece of worship, and created a new Kaaba because the original Kaaba, the, the original holy stone, had uh, inscriptions to hundreds of Arabic gods because in every pantheon, the gods, they had parents, they had aunties, uncles, children, like in Babylonian mythology, you had gods that were raping other gods and, and committing incest and, you know, inky, uh, and, 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 uh, I'm trying to remember the other god, but, but I mean, you, you, you got Zeus, you know, transforming himself and assaulting other gods and, 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 all, you know, all kind of crazy stuff going on. So that's that's where Paul was referring to this endless genealogy stuff. And he said, stay away from those arguments because there are no gods. There's only one God, singular. And that God is God, Jehovah. Stay away from science, so-called, which in the Greek, that word science is gnosis, which is actually where we get the word Gnosticism from. He says, stay away from all of that stuff. And really the root of Gnosticism, a lot of that comes out of Alexandria, which was in Egypt, <laughs> which was in Egypt. And that's where the Greek philosophers went to study. That was their place of higher education. All of the Greek philosophers went to Egypt to study and learn philosophy and, and learn science and everything else, and then went back to Greece with everything they learned from Egypt. And so this was, Alexandria was kind of one of those melting pots where everybody came and brought all of their ideologies and philosophies, their theologies, and, and it just became one big mixture. It is basically kind of like the, 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 the groundworks for today's modern New Age movement.
And Paul told his son in the ministry, Timothy, don't get caught up into all of that craziness, all of the, these arguments and all of that stuff. You know, stick with God's word. Stay on the straight and narrow path because if you start to stray off into that stuff, it will corrupt you. Now, I study, I study, and I study a lot, but I study so that I could, like a, well, I guess you would say apologetics, so that I could understand how to articulate my faith to people who have objections to my faith. But I'm rooted and grounded in what I believe, and I believe the word of God is the infallible word of God. The Bible is the infallible word of God. It is not a book of allegory. Yes, the Bible has different metaphors and things, but you have to study the word of God uh, uh, so that you can rightfully divide the word. And what he means there is so that you can understand the proper context of the scriptures. And that, that's something that takes work. That's something that takes time. And that's why I take the time and try to make sure I'm thorough whenever I'm doing these Bible studies. Amen. So, but some things you got to stay away from, because like I say, with all of these gods, you know, all these endless genealogies, it, it just, it leads, it really, I was about to say, it leads nowhere wrong. All, all occult roads lead back to Satan back to the serpent in the garden of eden back to back to that devil the dragon uh the serpent uh lucifer the light bearer they all lead right back to him and it's you know and and i i've, I've said this before the devil is not really so much interested if you look at satan's ideology his ideology he's not so much interested in you worshiping him He's more interested in you not worshiping God. As long as you don't worship God, he don't care what you worship. He don't care. In fact, in fact, actually, his ideology from Genesis chapter 3 to Eve is that eat the fruit so you can become God. Eve, translated, he would actually prefer that you begin worshiping yourself as a God. He don't care if, you, you know, all of these people will, you know, uh, uh, I forgot uh, years ago, I think it was back in 19, uh, maybe 87 or something. Uh, it was back in the 80s when Oprah Winfrey was doing her show and she invited a guy named Michael Aquinas over onto her uh, onto her show. And Michael Aquinas, he was the associate of Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan. And Michael Aquinos, he ended up parting ways from Anton LaVey because he said the church of Satan is too Mickey Mouse for him. So he started his own satanic church known as the Church of Set, set named after the Egyptian god of the underworld. Uh, there was Osiris, Isis, and then Set. So Michael Aquinos, he was on the Oprah Winfrey show. And he was explaining to Oprah Winfrey what Satanism really is, what it really believes. And he said Satanism is not so much about worshiping the devil as it is worshiping ourselves as our own gods. We create our own destinies. We are in charge of our own uh, uh, morality. I will, we decide what is right or wrong. We are our own gods. And Oprah stopped him and said, hold up. Everything that you're saying sounds like the new age, what we're into. And Michael Aquino said this. He says, actually, the only difference between Satanism and the new age movement is we Satanists actually know the identity of the God that we serve. You new agers are worshiping Satan, but you don't know it. <laughs> you, <laughs> you don't even know the name of the God that you're serving, but we we actually know his real identity. And I had this, uh, uh, I had the sound clip and everything, but you can go and look it up. Uh, it's if you can find that exact segment inside of that interview. Oh, it was on one of her live shows. It's interesting because again. The devil is not so much, you know, I just want you to bow and worship. You know, you know, yeah, people that are making deals with the devil, they are literally. But the truth be told is Satan is not so much concerned about you worshiping him and bowing before him. 
as long as you don't worship God. That's all. Why is that so important? Because if you worship any other God besides God, Jehovah, or if you decide not to worship God, Jehovah, but instead worship your own self as a God, moral relativism, situational ethics, uh, you deciding your own philosophy. You know, atheism is a religion. Humanism is literally designated as a religion. And humanism is nothing but the religion of atheism. <laughs> but they got their own churches, their own sanctuaries, their own tax exempt status, everything. And there was there was an interesting quote. I should have put this on the screen also. Uh, but there was an interesting quote by one of the leading humanists. Um, and he said, our sanctuaries are the public school classrooms. <laughs> and he said, what can the churches do? What can the Sunday schools do who only teach children for maybe one hour a week versus us? who get to train and indoctrinate children 40 hours a week, every single week. What can they do compared to us? So we are training them into evolution while the Sunday school teacher only get one hour to try to convince them that they were created by God. <laughs> that, that was actual quote by one of the leading members of the humanist uh, organization. And I have it uh, written in my book, Exposing the Great Deception. So it's interesting because that's an actual religion, religion of atheism. And yet the, the reality, like I say, is Satan is not concerned about you worshiping him. He's more concerned about you just not worshiping God because he knows if you never surrender to Christ, then the only other place that awaits you is a place known as hell. Glory to God, a place known as hell. Uh, let, me, let me put this on the screen here. I said I was going to put this on the screen. I, I, I said that about 30 minutes ago. So let me let me actually share it right quick. And this is this is kind of uh, the end of, of what we were talking about a little bit on yesterday. I'm sorry, not yesterday, last week. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Glory to God. Uh, last week um, where uh, we were just kind of bringing out uh, the, the fact that when we talk about the God, um, the God Apollos, the God Apollos, uh, who is uh, Apollos? And we really took a deep uh, dive into that God. That's a demon. It's just a demon spirit. And one of the things that we have to be careful is to come out of these organizations that revere and worship demon spirits. And I want to share this uh, because not just Freemasonry, but all of these fraternities and sororities, uh, you're going to have to make a decision. And let, let me share this. Uh, here we go. Here we go. All right. So uh, uh, and, and a lot of this, a lot of this information is found in the actual handbooks of themselves. But I'll put this on the screen right here that each of the organizations and fraternities, sororities are all connected to a spiritual deity. A God. So Alpha Phi Alpha, uh, they revere the God Horus, the Egyptian sun god. Now that's very dangerous because again, you go back to Ezekiel looking in the eighth chapter, you find where God is condemning the Israelites for the practice of idolatry. They were worshiping the sun god, they were worshiping Tammuz, uh, which which is the Babylonian equivalent of Horus. Uh, say the women were weeping for Tammuz uh, in secrecy. Uh, they were worshiping Baal. They were worshiping Molech. They had all of these different uh, altars and shrines to these different gods. And one of the things that I've been teaching uh, on Sundays uh, at, at Camelton Road is how in 2 Kings chapter 23, God brought uh, condemnation against the nation of Israel because of the sin of idolatry that they were worshiping all these idols. So God passed judgment upon them for that. But I want you to see this right here. And I know this, this don't sit well with some people, but it's all good. Uh, let the truth sting a little bit. The stinging is going to go away. And after the stinging go away, then it's going to really rest on your mind. And it's something for you to pray about. But 
Alpha, Alpha, Phi, Alpha, they worship Horus or they revere the sun god Horus, Alpha, Kappa, Alpha. Uh, they also uh, 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 revere Themis, the Titan goddess, uh, which is also mentioned in their uh, rituals. Um, and this is, again, the Sumerian goddess of beauty, love and lust. Uh, Dick, uh, Delta Sigma Theta, we talked about them last week. They have in there all through their rituals and charter and everything, the goddess Minerva, uh, the circle of Minerva. Hello, you're a devotee of Minerva now. And that is, again, the Roman goddess of wisdom. And that's a, nothing but a demon. All of these are demons. These are demonic spirits. Greek gods, they were all demonic spirits. From Zeus to Hades to, uh, you know, uh, or their Roman names, Neptune and so on and so on. All of the, the nothing but demonic spirits. Saturn and all that, nothing but demons. Um, uh, 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 what is this? The Iota Phi uh, Theta <laughs> uh, Centaur, uh, Centaur, which is a, an Egyptian mythical creature. Uh, Kappa Alpha Psi. Again, their god is Apollo. Apollos, um, which is, is, is dangerous. Um, even when you get to Omega Psi Phi, <clears throat> they revere and they have it even in their uh, emblems. Uh, they have the god Anubis, uh, which is an Egyptian god, the one that has the head of a of like a head of a dog in the body of a man. Now, <laughs> the, uh, uh, Phi, Phi Beta Sigma, Horus, again, um, uh, you have Sigma Gamma Rho, uh, which is again worshiping Matt, Ma Ma uh, the Egyptian goddess. These are Egyptian gods. Remember, uh, the Egyptian, the gods of the Egyptians, these are all idols that God commanded the Israelites, you better not worship them. And yet, they still made a golden calf and suffered the consequences as a result. Z uh, Zeta Phi Beta. Uh, 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 Bastet, the Egyptian cat headed goddess, and Archon, the demon god of the underworld, uh, which you find in Gnosticism. And again, all of these are the, the, the patron deities or the, the gods that are all revered in all of the fraternities. So, can you imagine that? I'm a member of a sorority or, or a member of a fraternity, and when I'm walking around and all of that stuff. And I'm literally going through the same type of rituals like Freemasons do, where I'm basically swearing and devoting myself to Horus, Apollos, Minerva. You know, uh, I'm swearing myself to the Egyptian god of the underworld. I'm swearing and devoting myself, you know, to the demon god of, you know, of lust and beauty. And, and then... In, in the midst of all of that, I'm coming to God, Jehovah, and I'm like, now nah, I want your blessings. And God is like, hold up, you want my blessings, but you you the one that literally just made an oath with a demon. Now, I'm going to say this, and I'm closing because, like I say, a lot of people, this is where folks start tuning out because this is hard to bear. But it doesn't matter because the truth is the truth. We ain't even talk about the rituals themselves. We're just talking about the fact that you are a part of something that reveres a demon, an idol God, as the head of that organization. And when you enter into covenant with a demon, listen, here's a rule of the kingdom. When you enter into covenant with a demonic spirit, that spirit has the authority to inflict your life and your family. Now, listen, what does that look like? There are some sicknesses, diseases, and there are other afflictions that come upon you and your family as a result of that spirit operating. It has free reign to begin to wreak havoc in your life. There are some things that as a result of a demonic intrusion into your life, physical sicknesses that attack your body, uh, even barrenness, according to the Old Testament in Ezekiel, I'm sorry, uh, in, uh, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, uh, even poverty and, 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 and blessings that 
God preserved for you that are completely held up because they cannot be released because you are in covenant with another God. Satan, when he has that kind of free range to operate in your life, and there's some things that we go through and we like, God, heal me. And the first thing God says to you, I will heal you, but I can't. I would, but I can't because you're in covenant with another demon. But you have to break that covenant, then get in covenant with me. Then I can release healing into your life because I can't bless you when you're another God's servant. And the Bible say people perish for a lack of knowledge. Just because you're ignorant does not mean you are not affected. If you're ignorant, it just simply means that the enemy is able to easily move in your life undetected and you're still perishing. So here I am on this Bible study tonight. And even though I didn't intend to talk about this any further, uh, I still went down that road and brought this out, brought it to light that there are some covenants that you may need to break in your life. Just like we did on last week, some of you that are watching, there are some covenants that you may need to break uh, in your life in order for certain blessings to be released and also in order for certain ailments, illnesses, sicknesses, uh, infirmities, uh, uh, demonic attacks and things to finally be uh, uh, to, to, to be blocked. There's some things that you need to break covenant with. Amen. Come out of covenant with it and renounce it. Um, and for those that are on the fence and they're like, but I don't know, this is, this is just, you know, it just feel like this is, it's like I'm walking away from family. You can still love people. But you don't have to be in covenant with the gods of that organization. In fact, you can still you don't have to pretend, participate in all of the stuff. And uh, you don't you don't you know flee the very appearance of evil. But you can still tell those same folk, hey, y'all, look, I found the truth. That truth is Jesus Christ. And the truth is, whether you're a Freemason, whether you're a five beta zeta, whatever, whether you are in this or order the Eastern star or whatever. Hey, look, you got to come out of that. You got to come out of covenant with the demons, the gods of those organizations. You got to just come out of those things and break the covenant there and come on over here into the church. Let me invite you to Bible study tonight. You know, get around some people who are in Christ. Uh, and, and that's what the Bible say. Be ye not unequally yoked. That's what it means. It's not just talking about marriage. Actually, in that verse, Paul didn't mention anything about marriage when he talked about do not be, un well, I'm sorry, he was talking about marriage, but it, it's a broader context, not just in the context of marriage and relationships, but also in the context of just in life in general, be cautious about being yoked up with people who are going in in a totally different direction from where God is taking you. You're walking in the light and they are walking in all of this other stuff. You got to you got to say God, send me send me some new friends or something, you know. Uh glory to God because I'm sorry, I I I just I can't I cannot make an oath to a demonic spirit because the second you make that oath and you make those vows you authorize those spirits to come into your life and to begin to wreak havoc in your life. And then God, his hands are tied when it comes to you because you are already in covenant with a demonic spirit. <clears throat> Glory to God. So I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, I feel like, like I'm in church on a Sunday morning and this is one of those endings where when you end, nobody's saying amen. <laughs> nobody's clapping. <laughs> and it's just like super quiet. Uh, organists, go ahead and play softly right now. <laughs> God. Amen. Play softly, uh, organists. Go ahead. I uh, should have had some music queued up in YouTube. <laughs> Glory to God. So we'll stop right there. Amen. Because this is one of those sobering moments. If there's anything you need to break covenant with, out of any of these cults, whether it's New Age, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, 
whether it's Freemasonry, whether it's sororities and fraternities, anything that is tied to the occult and to demonic spirits and all of that is all in the same boat. You know, you got to make that conscious decision and say, oh, Jesus, I break covenant with it today and I come out of agreement with it and I completely surrender to you today. So uh, we'll get to the to the six uh, trumpet uh, on, on next week. But I want to take time again and do this for someone that's watching. And, and I wanted to take time and really break this down even more than than on last week. But if you're watching and, and you know that this word hit hard, it hit home for you. There are some there are some demonic covenants that are made and they are made out of ignorance. And there are bloodline demons that affect entire families as a result of covenants made by parents out of ignorance. That does happen. But you can break generational curses by coming out of covenant, by breaking those agreements. And you can break them by, like I say, renouncing them and then uh, and then beginning to uh, appropriate the blood of Jesus. And the blood signifies that you are now under new ownership because the Bible say we were purchased by his blood. So that means you're letting that, those demons from those groups or whatever know I am no longer your property. I am the property of the Most High God. I am on the new ownership. You no longer have the legal rights to place your hands on my life, my family, my finances, my mind, my ministry. You no longer have the right. All rights have been revoked. You no longer have them because I am no longer under your covering. So the enemy recognizes that. When you when you when you get in covenant with God, and if you're watching today, then I want to pray this prayer, and I want you to pray it with me. In the name of Jesus, I thank you right now, Father. I thank you right now, Lord, for the word, for the teaching of the word right now. We give you this glory and honor, and thank you right now for the revelation of your word, revelation of the truth on tonight. Holy Spirit, we just thank you, Lord. Let your word continue to just settle in our hearts. Continue to just penetrate our hearts and continue to just have your way. Break up those hard places right now. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that the seed of the word was able to come into our hearts on tonight. And Lord, we just right now, if there's someone that you are in that boat where it's time for you to come out of covenant and agreement with all of these demonic things, then you repeat these words after me. Jesus, I break covenant with every demonic spirit and every demonic organization, I break covenant with every demon of the occult, every spirit of darkness, every demon that I have entered in the covenant with through ignorance, through organizations, sororities, fraternities, secret societies. I right now break that covenant in Jesus' name. For Satan, I renounce you. I rebuke you. You no longer have any authority over me. I renounce every association with every work of darkness, with every organization, fraternity, secret society, fraternity, sorority, every last with the occult, new age movement, other religious uh, uh, cults, I renounce them and I come out of agreement with them in Jesus' name. I even renounce every bloodline demon that has been given authority in my family, in my bloodline, to afflict me with sickness, with mental torment and anguish, to come against my life, my future, to come against God's divine purpose for me and my divine inheritance in Christ. I break your authority. I break your weapons. I break your works. And I thank you right now in Jesus' name that Satan, you were already defeated in Jesus' name. For I have broken covenant with you right now. And Father, I enter in the covenant with you. Forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for everything. I, I renounce every oath that I've made. 
every word that I've uttered, every word curse that I have spoken over my life and over my house. I renounce it in Jesus' name. And today, Father, I thank you that I am free. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood over my mind, my body, my life, my family, my finances, my health. I belong to you, Jesus. I surrender to you today. And I thank you right now in Jesus' name. Now, right now, Lord, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you may release, 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 release. And, you know, there are even demons, like I said, there are spirits that operate even when people are in things that appear to be Christian, but are, that, but are actually what I would consider more of a counterfeit. Uh, some things that are practiced in Roman Catholicism, bowing before statues of Mary, uh, wearing prayer beads, which actually is a Hindu practice, believe it or not. All of these things, oh no, we come out of agreement with it because God is a God we worship in spirit and truth, not worship with our physical eyes by looking at statues or praying to patron saints. No, that is idolatry. So I want you to speak those same words. I denounce this and I come out of agreement with every form of idolatry. And Father, I repent and I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. And I surrender to you and your will. Holy Spirit, come into my heart. Come into my life. Fill me with your presence. Fill me, Holy Spirit, from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. And I just say yes to you today. I receive the release of the anointing. I receive the release of the divine inheritance that God has for me. I receive a release of healing right now into my body and into my mind. I receive a release right now. Even over my children, I come against every spirit of infirmity attacking their bodies. And I cancel your works in the name of Jesus. And we thank you right now, Father. Hallelujah, for the anointing and the fire of the Holy Ghost as we speak it and we receive it right now in the name of Jesus. And I thank you right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, glory to your name. Don't take any of what we just did lightly. You just dealt the devil his biggest black eye. Here he's going to be ticked off and angry, but what can he do about it? Amen. The angels of the Lord are encamped around you. The enemy, all he can do is talk and talk a big game and try to convince you to go back. But no, you let him know, I ain't going back. I'm staying firm right here where God planted me. In fact, I'm moving forward in Christ. And I'm not even considering yesterday. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And we give God praise, glory, and honor. Now, I know I went over just a little bit, but I think it was pretty, pretty necessary, pretty worth it. Amen. So if you're watching tonight, look, we never close out without allowing people who are watching the opportunity to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Amen. I know we just prayed a prayer, what we call a renouncement prayer. Amen. To break covenant with the enemy. But this is for someone who may be watching and you just don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you would like to accept them into your life, surrender to them, then I want you to just pray this prayer with me. Uh, say, Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner, and I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and rose from the grave on the third day. Wash me with your blood and make me the person that you predestined for me to be. I denounce the world, and I receive your plan for my life. Today, I am yours. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. You're a child of the king. I want to tell you to get into a good church home. Find you a good church, a good place where you can go and worship and fellowship with other believers because you're going to need that support system. Amen. And we do have information at the bottom of the screen. If you want to join the Mount Carmel Baptist Church family, you can call or email the church. But I always tell people, join somebody's church. Get involved with someone's ministry. Why? Because you need to be surrounded by others in the faith that can keep you rooted, grounded, and focused. Amen. And a good church is a place that teaches the infallible word of God and believes in the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 
Also, as we do each and every week, I give those that are tuning in. If the word blessed you, then I definitely open up the opportunity for you to sow into the word. Amen. Sow into that, into this word today. And I tell people, please do not go to Cash App. Oh, Lord have mercy. I'm going to remember one day to, to, to wipe that off. I'm just going to put blackout or something, blot out, whatever. But don't go to Cash App. Amen. You can go to the website, timothyflemingjr.com. Scroll all the way down to the bottom into the footer section where you'll find the word donate in the footer. Uh, you can click there and you can sow a ministry seed. I always stand on the principle from 2 Corinthians that God ministers seed to the sower. So the more that I sow, the more God blesses me with more to give. Amen. But you got to sow in a good soil, sow in a good, good, good ground. Amen. And sow into the word of that word has been a blessing in your life. Amen. So for those that are sowing a ministry seed, go right to the website and you can sow right there. Amen. You're going to see. Uh, my face at the top, just go all the way down to the bottom to the footer and you'll see the word donate and that's where you give. Amen. Until next week, may God continue to keep you and bless you and his face continue to shine upon you. And I can't wait to be back next week again uh, for the Issachar Hour as we continue to move, food, move through, move through trucking. Amen. Moving forward. Next week, we're going to talk about that sixth trumpet, and it's going to be pretty interesting. Amen. So I'll see you then. Until then, God bless.